Chapter Twenty Three of Whither Thou Goest by William Le Cue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Twenty Three. The next morning, Guy Rossett and Farquhar were admitted to a private audience of the king. A gracious message had been transmitted to Moreno through the agency of the chief of police. It would not have been very politic on the part of that enterprising young man to show himself at the palace. His Majesty thanked them both warmly for their services, and was very interested in the details which they gave him of that eventful evening. "'I know England well and love it,' he said. "'As long as she breeds such sons as you, she will always remain the first of great nations. Last night's work was good. My poor country will have a more peaceful time now that we have laid these bloodthirsty scoundrels by the heels.' Moreno's overpowering impulse was to get back to England as quickly as possible, but there was a certain duty to perform first. He must pay his promised visit to Violet Hargrave. He called about eleven o'clock. He found her looking pale and languid from the effects of the powerful mixture he had given her. Pulling round, he inquired as they shook hands, "'I can see you are, but you won't be quite yourself for a few hours. Well, tell me what happened.' I arrived late at the meeting and simply heard from Contreras that Alvedero had reported you were indisposed. But I learned no details and, of course, did not press for any. Did they fetch a doctor to you? If so, what is his verdict? A faint smile spread over her pale face. He has only left a few minutes ago. He came to the conclusion that I dosed myself with drugs. I allowed him to believe that I did. Of course, I have never drugged in my life a very clever man an ornament to his profession remarked moreno dryly still how the devil should he guess being totally ignorant of the circumstances and the symptoms were precisely those which would have been produced by a long course of drugging mrs hargrave laid her hand upon his arm and spoke in a serious voice what of last night there is nothing in the papers this morning i have sent out for half a dozen tell me what happened the Brotherhood has been defeated again. He rehearsed the scene for her benefit and came to the concluding portion. Just as they were about to remove Rossett, I distinctly heard a low whistle that was repeated a few seconds later. I just pulled aside the curtain and saw that the house was surrounded. I had hardly put the blind back when the door was burst open and the police swarmed in. They cut Rossett loose and took him downstairs. They covered us with revolvers and made us take off our masks. The chief who was with them recognized Contreras, Zerilto, and Alvadero. Myself and Somoza he did not recognize. Ah, Violet Hargrave drew a long breath. You were the only one who escaped then. How did you manage it? By a miracle. I always keep my head in a crisis. As soon as I heard them rushing up the stairs, I drew near to the door, hoping to escape in the confusion. It was, of course, a thousand to one chance. While all the attention was being concentrated on Contreras and the others, of course the chief didn't expect to bag such a big game, I drew my knife, plunged it into the breast of the man guarding the door, I fear I killed him, poor fellow, flew down the stairs, knocked over another chap, and dodged through them. Violet Hargrave surveyed him critically. "'I am afraid you haven't a very high opinion of my intelligence. That is the story you will tell the Lesue, Maqueda, and Jacques when we meet again in London.' it does not impose upon me. You have escaped right enough, but you escaped with the connivance of the police. Moreno bit his lip. He had presumed a little too much upon feminine incredulity. At any rate, you are not in their clutches, he said quietly. I saved you. Don't forget that. She reached out her hand. Please forgive me. I am very grateful for what you have done. Of course, if I had gone there, you could not have saved me. I should have been taken with the others. You could save Guy Rossett and yourself. Even your clever brain could not have taken in a third. I repeat, I am very grateful. Moreno retained her hand in his. Secretive as he was by nature, he felt that the time for dissimulation was past. When we get to London, I am leaving tonight, and the sooner we make tracks the better. We will respect each other's secrets. I have still in my possession the photograph copy of that document which you sold to Guy Rossett. 
she drew away her hand from his with an indignant gesture oh you think i am utterly irretrievably base she cried bitterly you think i would betray you after what you have done for me save me from death or a lifelong imprisonment she broke into wild sobbing he put his arm round her and drew her gently towards him till her crying ceased my poor little violet he whispered gently let us speak together quite frankly you are on your own showing an adventuress with i believe some very womanly instincts well i am not quite sure that i am very much better you sold the cause for money i sold it for money too plus conviction i wonder if we could turn over a new leaf lead a new life together if i could find somebody who really cared for me cried the pretty little blonde woman still tearful jacques loves me i am sure but just with the love of a father well i care for you said moreno and this time he spoke without any reservation violet lifted her face to his and their lips met then she shivered but how can we escape from this horrible brotherhood the sway and jacques are left they will exact their pound of flesh they will snare us into equally dangerous enterprises moreno snapped his fingers bah if i have outwitted contreras and the others i will soon settle the sway's hash as to poor old jacques it won't take long to convince him that he is more safely employed in earning a hundred per cent on his capital than in trying to blow up respectable people who have certainly never injured him the fate of the others will frighten him violet drew herself from his protecting arm and dried her eyes i think dear i can really turn into a good woman she said plaintively you see i have never had a proper chance when i married jack and i was genuinely fond of him i thought i had met a gentleman can you guess what he really was a card sharper suggested moreno with his uncanny facility of guessing conundrums mrs hargrave nodded her blond head you have hit it a week after we were married he told me all about himself we were to take an expensive flat in mount street and he would bring people there he spent three weeks in teaching me an elaborate system of signalling as a rule we played together but he had another couple of confederates to ward off suspicion did you tell jacques of this no i was too ashamed jacques is of course a rogue in his own way but not that way he was opposed to the marriage at first and i was keen on it i made out that jack was a man of good family and well off i believed all he told me at the start i didn't want to own that i had been taken in i quite understand replied moreno by the way of course you didn't know that poor old contreras is dead contreras dead how did he die it appears that he always carried some poison tablets in his pocket in case of accidents before they handcuffed him they are a bit slower here than in paris or london he swallowed one of them and died as they took him downstairs poor old man he was a terrible fanatic but he was more honest than most of them i don't suppose there will be much mourning in fitzjohn's avenue i expect his family will be glad to have got rid of him he kissed her very tenderly as he bade her good-bye a new life little woman from to-day a new life from to-day she repeated softly as long as i am sure that you really care i do care replied moreno speaking with unusual fervor for a man of his cautious temperament of the london section of the brotherhood little remains to be told shortly afterwards lesue was stabbed to death in a violent quarrel with a brother anarchist jacques and maqueda alarmed at the fate of their spanish colleagues took but a perfunctory part in further propaganda in twelve months time the london section had ceased to exist as an active force on a mellow october day a few months after those thrilling events in madrid isabel was married in the quiet little church on her uncle's estates it was in this church that her father had been christened her bridesmaids were lady mary and two cousins her uncle the head of the family gave her away for the head of the family and his wife had behaved quite properly on the occasion they had insisted that she should be married from their house that she should have the whole-hearted support of her kindred such an arrangement suited her very well her bereavement had been so recent that the idea of a fashionable wedding 
would have been repugnant to her. Here in this quiet little church, where generations of Clandons had been christened, many of them married, she gave herself to the man of her choice. With the advent of his great aunt's considerable fortune, Guy's brief fit of ambition died out. And it must be admitted that, although he had stuck gallantly to his post and refused to show the white feather, his experience of diplomatic life had been more exciting than pleasant. So he severed his connection with the Foreign Office, having made up his mind to lead the easy and agreeable life of a man of wealth and position. They were to spend their honeymoon in Italy. On their return they would renovate Aunt Henrietta's charming country residence in Hampshire and take a house in London where they intended to spend a good deal of their time. For Guy was very proud of his beautiful Isabel and he could see a time when she would become a very charming and popular hostess. The young couple drove away amidst the cordial greetings of the small company assembled. Only a few intimate connections of the two families remained. Moreno had been invited, but he had excused himself on some plausible pretext. He had no desire to thrust himself into an aristocratic milieu to which he was unaccustomed. He sent the bride a very handsome present with a card on which was written, from Andreas Moreno, as a souvenir of thrilling times in Spain. When Lord Saxon was saying good-bye to the Clandons, Maurice Farquhar conducted Lady Mary to the car which was to drive them back to Ticehurst Park, a distance of about fifty miles. "'You will not forget that you are due to us on the twenty-fifth, she reminded him as they shook hands. "'Is it likely? I have been looking forward to it ever since you sent me the invitation.' I am looking forward to it, too, said Mary softly, and a rather becoming color swept over her cheek, making her look quite attractive. The Earl joined them and mounted the car. He waved his hand cheerfully as they drove off. Not good-bye, but au revoir, Farquhar. See you on the twenty-fifth. He watched the car drive out of sight, thinking of many things. He had loved Isabel with all the fervor of first love, but Isabel was gone from him. And Mary was very sweet and attractive, and took no pains to conceal that she took great pleasure in his society. Well, perhaps some day. But even in his secret thought the young and ambitious barrister could hardly bring himself to believe that a girl of Mary's birth and long descent would give herself to a man who had only his brains to recommend him. Still, this younger generation of the Rossets had a strange democratic strain in them. Guy had chosen his bride from the small squirearchy. It was openly rumored in the clubs that, having come into a snug little income from great Aunt Henrietta, Lord Ticehurst had made up his mind to marry his chorus girl and defy his father. Lady Mary had also been well provided from the same kind source. She might prove as democratic as the others. And while Farquhar was ruminating over all these things, Isabel and her husband had set out on the first stage of their journey to the enchanted land of wedded romance. This is the end of Whither Thou Goest by William Lequeux. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.